Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, I am Abraham Saif. Um, I am the CEO of Jordan Strategy Forum, and it is and it is with uh, pleasure that I welcome you to this session on public sector reform in the Middle East and North Africa. We're going to uh, highlight and uh, present the main findings of the book entitled Public Sector Reform in the Middle East and North Africa, was co-authored by Farid uh, Yusuf and Robert Bishop. Um, before I would like to draw the attention of the participants that uh, we have some Yeltonous interpretation. And for those uh, to listen to the English, please use the English interpretation channel. Just go to this inter interpretation and switch to the French channel. Uh, click on mute original audio for that matter. Um, the book we are presenting today is co-authored by, again, Tariq Youssef and um, Robert Bashir. The book is presenting the uh, issues regarding the uh, the huge sector in the Middle East, which is the public sector. No matter how, no matter how we identify this, this book offers a comprehensive assessment of a wide range of reform efforts in nine countries. book also is presenting cases where reform has achieved certain outcomes uh, and uh, uh, and it's, it's a mixed outcome indeed uh, that uh, we're looking at for example in the case of jordan uh, they have the book have looked at the restructuring of the cabinet operation In Palestine, it looks at the revision of the public financial management. Uh, in Morocco, it looks at the voluntary retirement program. And similarly, look at human resource management reform in Lebanon and the government initiative in Dubai. But clearly, the overall or the overarching conclusion, which I think is going to be represent, uh, presented by Mr. Robert Bessel, is that this, this, this process entails huge political and social aspects that cannot be overlooked when you undertake what we refer to as public sector reform. So it's not purely a traditional way of doing and, and reforming public sector. Um, a very uh, quick brief um, on the authors of the book that we're going to present and with a highlight with Jordan. Dr. Tariq Yusuf, he's a friend, but he is now leading. He's a non-resident senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Program. and leading the Brookings Institute in Doha. Uh, before that, I know that he has been working at Georgetown University, graduated from Harvard Kennedy School. And I must say that I have read Tariq before I've known him personally. So it's, uh, 
and uh, we always uh, came to uh, agree on several issues when it comes to how we should navigate economic and political reform. And this is his, 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 his core, core focus, indeed. It's the political economy in the region and, and, and quite recently his interests include post-conflict political and economic transitions. No wonder living in this region you have to focus on the post-conflict and the restart. Uh, Robert Bessler as well, I, I know Robert Bessler, he is a non-resident senior fellow with Brooking Doha Center as well, uh, where, where his research interest concentrates on governance and public sector reform throughout the Middle East and North Africa. He's known Rob since his work or ex in the World Bank and the uh, how much he pushed and uh, focused on these issues uh, in the Middle East, and in particular, we're focusing on what we refer to as a public sector reform, which is, you know, he worked and covered over 50 countries, so we hope that uh, we benefit from his extensive knowledge in covering and reviewing countries when it comes to improving governance and improving the performance of the public sector in general. Yeah. Um, the way we are going to conduct this uh, is that uh, I will have a very uh, brief comment. I have uh, this book, Public Sector Reform, indeed uh, um, has a chapter in Jordan, uh, which is uh, highlighting the main feature of the public sector. Uh, when I was reviewing this chapter uh, yesterday and today, uh, just to tell the audience uh, where we stand on this, and how much time our, since the, the, the focus of the chapter in Jordan about restructuring the, uh, the, the way that the Prime Minister is functioning, or how the Cabinet is functioning. Maybe uh, uh, the analogy or the comparison between how many policy-oriented or decisions being discussed uh, in an OECD country in general and in a country like Jordan. Um, in, I think, 2014 or 15, an average OECD cabinet would discuss annually five to seven hundred policy issues or, or, or policy oriented or decisions that has to be taken at the cabinet level. That number in Jordan in the same year was 20,500. This would never mean that the performance of Jordan's government is better than the OECD government. But it tells you how fragmented and how concentrated and how much time is being dedicated to such issues at the cabinet level, while the focus should be on more a details oriented approach similar to the one that we are adopting in Jordan leaves little room for policy making as we can see. And even the chapter on Jordan present few cases where what kind of decision that has to be taken, uh, what had to be taken at the cabinet level that are totally unnecessarily and consuming the time of the cabinet. But I want to expand the, the highlight and the focus on Jordan chapter by saying that there, there are some there are assumptions about how to restructure the, the, the public policy performance or the public sector reform, assuming that there is a unified or a consensus within the public sector on how to proceed. I am challenging this uh, Rob Pare, uh, that this is not the case and, and the way forward was not was never something clear uh, to that effect. To the contrary you would find resistance sometimes within the bureaucracy 
you would find the gap between the top senior bureaucrats and the junior level or the middle bureaucrats in that matter, which would complicate things. Also, I would challenge the assumption that the skills acquired or required to invoke changes and to move forward is there and embedded. Not necessarily so, because sometimes resistance would emerge because skills are not there for that matter. So you're lacking the roadmap and you're lacking the skills to do it. You lack the consensus to do it. And you have a gap between the senior and junior. So that even if you put all the political and social implications aside, it will be very difficult for us to move forward in pursuing public sector reform. <clears throat> A final point, it's about when we established the public sector reform in Jordan, it was small and it was like a fit uh, 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 function, a fit for purpose style, which recently uh, I have the pleasure to co-author a small piece in this with uh, Tamar Abed from uh, E&Y in Jordan, where we identified this issue uh, on what kind of function you used to do and what is the function that is required from you today. And even in the book, it was identified the huge mandate that sometimes ministers can change, uh, can change uh, and, uh, and, and, and dictate uh, the uh, uh, mandate of, of the ministers for that matter. Uh, the last thing I also would add uh, is now, uh, and maybe this is, will take us for the discussion, we hope to move from a government that is totally service provider and doing everything to a government that is enabler. So, and that was also the title of this short piece that we wrote, from service providing to enablers uh, in that matter. So with these, of course, discretionary IT solutions are moving forward with all remedies and, and recipes that we have been contemplating and discussing, but it's time you have maybe have this broader view from you, Rob, about how you see the Middle East and how Jordan fits in, in, in all this process. Uh, and then uh, I'll give Tariq the floor also to have his comment before we can open uh, the floor for discussion with our participants. We're glad to organize this event with Bokin uh, Doha, and we look forward to have uh, more uh, events similar to this. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't put much of the time, but Rob, the floor is yours. We'll give you 20 to 22 minutes, Rob, uh, so we can make sure we get, have space for discussion later. So go ahead, Rob. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, thank you so much uh, for your invitation. It's a great privilege to be here. Uh, Jordan is one of my favorite countries. Uh, I've been privileged to spend a considerable amount of time there. I have many dear Jordanian friends. Uh, I've been privileged at a couple different junctures to be involved in various dimensions of public sector reform uh, in Jordan. And uh, it's a remarkable country with uh, extremely talented people and some very unique challenges. And so uh, we're going to talk a bit about public sector reform more broadly in the region, but uh, we'll also uh, have a chance to speak a bit about public sector reform in Jordan. And the comments I will share from you are from the heart, uh, from somebody who loves Jordan, who loves the Jordanian people and who really uh, wishes for the best, including a, a very high performing, talented, you know, affordable public sector. So um, let me begin by just uh, sharing uh, some slides with you. And uh, tell me, can you, uh, can you see the presentation? How's that? Okay, good. I get the thumbs up from Tarek, so uh, uh, that is good news. Um, one of the challenges uh, that many economists, political scientists, and public sector specialists have, have pondered with regard to the Middle East region more generally uh, has been what's been called the governance gap, uh, the gap in uh, performance and productivity 
uh, in the public sector vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other uh, regions uh, of the world. And here you can see uh, a slide that looks at the worldwide governance indicators, which are done by the bank. There's been a proliferation of global governance indices over the last few years on a whole host of topics. And uh, the worldwide governance indicators are, are one of the more established. I've pulled four uh, metrics here, voice and accountability, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, control of corruption. Uh, there are, are others as well. Um, and uh, you, you can, when you go on the, the website for the worldwide governance indicators, you can pull up any one of a combination of countries or regions and benchmark them against each other. I, I've just chosen the OECD here. Um, uh, and what you see here uh, is it does sort of illustrate uh, the persistence of a governance gap. Uh, in the performance. Now, there's wide variation within uh, the Middle East, North Africa region. Uh, some countries uh, perform much better, typically those in the GCC, and Jordan is uh, occasionally in the mix there. We'll talk about that later. Uh, other countries really struggle on these issues. Uh, and so you do have a significant spectrum throughout the region. So these are regional averages. Uh, it's interesting, there is one uh, metric where the MENA region does better uh, on global indices than uh, the global average. And uh, that is uh, on e-governance in the use of IT. That's one area where the region is uh, ahead of the curve uh, globally. Uh, but in other areas, as you can see, there is a, uh, there is a gap. Uh, and Tarek and I cared passionately about uh, this. I mean, uh, governance will be essential to the region's long-term development. Governments uh, spend trillions of dinars or dirham, and uh, how they spend that money will have a huge impact. Uh, they deliver critical services, they regulate the private sector, uh, they perform a host of tasks that, that will be absolutely uh, essential. Uh, and increasingly so as you, as you look downstream and, uh, you know, they're called to counter global challenges like uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change and things like that. So, so governments play a crucial role. Uh, one of the challenges, if you look at uh, public sectors in the MENA region, vis-a-vis uh, -vis many public sectors in other parts of the world, uh, is that they're large and they are expensive. And, and in many cases, uh, they are on a fiscally unsustainable trajectory. Uh, and that's going to be a fundamental challenge. Many countries in the region have struggled with issues of unemployment. They have a large demographic bulge, a lot of youth looking for work. And over the years, people have been put into the public sector and you're now reaching a point where these public sectors are large and financially unsustainable. And so that strategy, which has worked in the past, uh, is unlikely to be effective in the, in the future. Another challenge when you look at uh, countries in this region, uh, and it's sort of mixed news, the good news is many of them have expanded coverage. Uh, so they're now capable to provide universal education and healthcare. And so, and that's a significant accomplishment. Uh, uh, but the downside is there's often a significant variation in quality. Uh, if you get out in the rural hinterland in Egypt or Morocco or places like that, the quality of services uh, is not what you would find in Rabat, Casablanca, or Cairo. Uh, and, and so that's a, uh, that's a fundamental issue. And then also in areas like education, uh, if you look at age-adjusted learning gaps and things like that, I, you find that uh, even though there's universal education, uh, there are often uh, gaps and people are below the, uh, where they should be in terms of, uh, you know, learning per a, a given age or a given grade in school. So, so that's, uh, that's another challenge. And then finally, there's the challenge of corruption and WASTA 
And uh, as you know, uh, uh, when recent uh, popular uprisings have happened, whether it's in Lebanon, whether it's in Sudan, whether it's in Algeria, uh, the whole issue of sort of cronyism and insider trading and corruption uh, has been at the core. There's a lot of perceptions that uh, uh, there's a favored few and everyone else and that the playing field isn't level. Uh, and, so, and so these are sort of some of the significant governance challenges that the region has been grappling with, will continue to be grappling with uh, over the next decade. Uh, and and uh, I think that every country in different ways, in different dimensions, sort of finds itself dealing with some of these sets of issues. Uh, and this is fairly widely known. Uh, there were two things, though, that really, I think, animated Tarek and I. Uh, one of them, uh, is there has been a significant amount of public sector reform in MENA. Uh, it's been interesting. And as we looked across the region, uh, we saw that there have been a significant number of efforts to, to try to improve the functioning of the public sector. Uh, some have gone well, others not so much, but, uh, but there is a body of experience that we felt would be of interest. Uh, to people thinking and worrying about how do you make improvements in this area. And then secondly, when you look globally at the study of public administration, uh, the case study method is often used. I mean, particularly Tarek and I came from the Kennedy School at Harvard, which has a collection of 2,000 or so cases on public sector reforms. And what was really noticeable when you look at this body was how, how little time and attention was devoted to the Middle East, North Africa region. Uh, literally in the Kennedy School's database of over 2,000 cases, uh, there were less than five that, that dealt with the Middle East. Uh, and so we felt it was, uh, you know, there was a huge lacuna, a huge gap here, and we wanted to do what we could to make a uh, contribution to that. Uh, so anyhow, we looked at uh, a combination of cases, and here's where they are. <clears throat> These were, um, uh, we wanted to look across countries, so we had the Maghreb, we had the Mashrek, uh, we had uh, countries from the GCC, uh, we wanted to look at across topics, so we looked at uh, some sets of reforms that were on center of government, operations that affect the whole public sector. And then we looked at some agency specific reforms to see, um, to see what we could look, uh, learn from, from here. Uh, and uh, we ended up coming across these, uh, these cases. Uh, as I said, they had the diversity which we liked. Uh, uh, part of the issues were access to, quite frankly. Um, you, know, you know, we looked for the, the cases where we could get them, and so it was difficult to get cases from Syria or Yemen or Libya, and, and we didn't do that. But uh, we did find these. And uh, I think they're some of the most interesting cases that took place, and, and in some respects, some of the most far-reaching cases that took place. Uh, as you can see from, the, uh, uh, from this slide, uh, some of them were amazingly successful, really had quite significant contributions. Uh, others fell somewhere in the muddled middle, and uh, one of them, the case of human resource reforms, was uh, a flaming disaster, but a destructive one. So, so it was uh, an interesting mix in terms of success. I'm going to talk briefly about the substance uh, of these uh, reforms, what they looked at, and uh, what I would do at the beginning uh, is it's interesting to reflect on what was not in the mix. You know, what were the dogs that didn't bark? Uh, and, and here, if you look at the, the broader body of, of Arab public sector reforms in general, against what a lot of public sector reforms were doing elsewhere in the globe, uh, a couple of things stand out at you. Uh, one of them uh, is in many parts of the world, there was a strong emphasis on devolution and decentralization of power, sort of pushing responsibility down to lower levels of government. Uh, that's not something you see a lot of in MENA. Throughout the Middle East, governments are very heavily centralized. 
privatization was a huge agenda. It was particularly large in Latin America, but it also played a role in East Asia elsewhere. And privatization has not really taken off in MENA. Uh, you still have a lot of state-owned enterprises and the, the hand of the state is quite large in the economy here. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's the issue of social accountability and citizen empowerment. Uh, you've seen some movement here recently, and we have a case from Tunisia on their right to information legislation. And so uh, we touched upon that, and that's a, that's a fascinating story. But if you look at other parts of the world, there's really been a tsunami of transparency and right to information legislation. And, and that's just barely lapping up on the shores of MENA. It, it hasn't, um, you know, it hasn't really taken off. Well, one of the key areas, and I'm grateful to Dr. Ibrahim for really highlighting this, uh, that we looked at are center of government reforms. These are reforms to the prime minister's office, the presidency, uh, the Amiri Diwan, uh, cabinet operations. Uh, typically, they look at uh, efforts to try to improve the quality of policy making. Uh, they can look a lot at performance monitoring. Uh, there's been a huge push on delivery and the creation of delivery units. And uh, it's interesting because the case that we have here is from Jordan was in early, uh, uh, it was 2006. Uh, but then Jordan continued working on this agenda for some time. And, and so initial efforts were not particularly successful, but downstream uh, there were some reforms that, uh, that um, you know, were, were successful in Jordan. So it, it had kind of a mixed legacy there. Uh, center of government reforms are a critical area. It's a complicated area. Uh, it's an area where sort of traditional forms of decision making, which are, uh, you know, informal consultation come up against uh, rational bureaucratic forms of organization. And that fit is often an imperfect one. Uh, and then what's really interesting, and I'm not going to elaborate this now, but we can elaborate this in the discussion, uh, is um, there are also challenges of bureaucratic culture. And uh, what you can find is that uh, in East Asia, where uh, a variety of uh, reforms have been made, such as Malaysia and the Prime Minister's uh, delivering results unit, you know, Pemandu, uh, there was very strong pressure to, for lower levels to resolve, of the bureaucracy to resolve issues. And, and if things get kicked upstairs, it's viewed as a failure. We find quite the opposite happening in MENA. In MENA, a lot of decisions are kicked up, as Dr. Ibrahim said. And as a result, it tends to really complicate decision making at the highest, uh, at the highest levels. Uh, this is just a brief slide. I'm not going to dwell on it uh, at length. But uh, this was an analysis of uh, sort of the prime minister's office in, uh, in Jordan around 1910. Uh, and you can see some of the uh, challenges, and again, just underscoring the point that Dr. Ibrahim made, a strong focus on administrative tasks rather than, uh, you know, viewing this as sort of the apex policy, uh, policy unit. A, a second area that was fundamental, and we looked at this very closely, were reforms of public financial management. And uh, here, um, uh, there are a variety of challenges that one finds throughout the uh, region. And you can see uh, we've listed some of them here. Revenues are often unstable, uh, you know, particularly in the GCC, where you're dealing with uh, a fluctuating price of oil. Uh, comprehensiveness of the budget process. When you're in the World Bank and the IMF, we argue the budget should be as comprehensive as possible. And yet in many countries, the budget's really fragmented and uh, expenditure takes place through a variety of different entities that it could be off budget. And particularly that's a problem with state-owned enterprises that can uh, rack up expenditures that ultimately fall back upon the um, Ministry of Finance. Uh, many countries, there's a disconnect between planning and finance. And so planning is undertaking initiatives that will have 
fiscal implications that aren't getting fully captured in the budget. You have a weak independent audit. Uh, and, and then another challenge you have is that there, there tends to be a focus on cost containment instead of really looking at efficiency. And so that can result in sort of arbitrary budget cuts for various line departments uh, instead of thinking carefully uh, about how you can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of their operations. Um, we have seen some uh, successful reforms uh, in the MENA region, uh, and they tend to fall in a couple of different categories. Some of them are sort of modest technocratic reforms like budget classification. Uh, others uh, are much more difficult, but there's a huge prize, and that is reforms on tax and customs. If you're trying to raise revenue from the perspective of the Ministry of Finance, you really want those reforms to succeed. Uh, and then secondly, what's been, or third, what's been interesting to see uh, are reforms in uh, budget transparency. And countries like Egypt have managed to make some significant uh, progress uh, progress there. Um, I'm going to pivot now to civil service reforms because these are often among the most difficult and complicated. Uh, these are uh, here, as I mentioned earlier, uh, governments are facing a host of challenges uh, that really cut into the productivity and efficiency of the public sector. Uh, one of them uh, is the wage bill in many countries, you know, as we said, wages are on an unsustainable trajectory. Uh, you do have, uh, and this is good news in countries, there, in many countries there's sort of a generational shift taking place and there's a younger uh, tech savvy group in their 30s that are chomping in the bit and ready to go and so I think uh, in a number of countries, thinking about managing this sort of generational transition will be uh, important. We look at two sets of cases in the book uh, dealing with these issues. One of them was a voluntary retirement program in Morocco, which was an effort to deal with the, the size of the civil service and the size of the wage bill. And uh, it's an interesting story. It's a complicated story. By and large, the Moroccans were successful. Uh, financially, uh, they reduced the, the burden of the wage bill, which was good, but they encountered a problem typical to voluntary retirement programs, which is the best and the brightest leave, and you're left with people for whom this job is the best one they'll have they can find. And so, so uh, the, the financial burden of the public sector went down, the quality of the overall public sector also dropped, and, and that was an issue there. And then we looked at human resource uh, management reforms in Lebanon. And as I said, that was a very uh, complicated tale and one that uh, uh, didn't necessarily come out well, but there are things that can be done. Uh, I'm gonna go quickly through these two slides. They're just on civil service. This slide uh, makes a point that's very common in other countries, which is that the um, uh, uh, if you look at how civil servants are paid in the MENA region, uh, you tend to pay uh, those on the lower end a lot. So, so staff with limited skills often tend to get paid much above their uh, market value. Uh, whereas it falls off towards the high end and when you want to go out and get financial analysts or IT specialists, those uh, skills are often in short supply and the salaries may not be adequate to really bring these people in. Um, this slide simply uh, sa makes the point that most countries in the Middle East need to focus more on the, both ends of the performance distribution curve. You need to cultivate talent on the high end uh, and you need to deal much more effectively with low performing workers. Uh, on the uh, on the low end. Um, I, in addition to the center of government reforms, which I've talked about, we also looked at agency specific reforms. A and these were very interesting. And there were a number that were quite successful by any metric. Uh, they did things faster, cheaper, uh, with higher quality and more citizen responsiveness. So, I mean, it's really interesting to see how uh, 
how well these uh, uh, these reforms did. One of my favorite is from Jordan, and you can look at this. It's in our book. It's also on the website for Princeton's Innovations for Successful Society. It was reforms to document processing. Uh, they played out over a decade. Uh, uh, the hero is uh, Nazu uh, Marzuka. And uh, he encountered a, a variety of different challenges. You'll see that in the case. These were the issues he confronted. Um, and he was able to make quite an effective, uh, quite an effective impact there. And uh, really fundamentally, I think, changed the performance and orientation of that. Uh, uh, of that. A uh, couple lessons that we, that we learned from that. First of all, people worry about organi or organization or uh, work culture and work ethos. And, and uh, you know, at a national level, uh, that's really not an issue. Uh, organizational culture is really shaped uh, at the organizational level. And, and Marzuka does a superb job of really changing the organizational culture there. Um, he also, sorry, the second point here, just to, to do it, the importance of strategic opportunism. I mean, he did not bring in an army of consultants or World Bank experts to give him advice and develop a 13-point strategy and laid it out on a Gantt chart. And so by June 2024, you'll be here. Uh, he just sort of looked for opportunities that emerged and exploited it. He knew where he wanted to go. He knew he had a broader sense of what the reforms were he wanted to take forward. And if a door shut, he wouldn't go there, he'd go somewhere else. Uh, this is just a brief slide that, that again highlights his, his ability to sort of brilliantly look at what he could control, what was directly under his control, what he could influence, and what he couldn't. And he thought very carefully and systematically about that and just managed to use the reforms effectively. And here's, here's a list of the solutions that he came up with <clears throat> to the problems that he faced. It's, it's a wonderful case and I strongly encourage you to, to look at it. Okay, a couple of quick things just to wrap up and I'll hand it over to Tarek. Um, heart to heart, uh, you know, how do we unpack the enigma of Jordan public sector reforms? Uh, Jordan is a country that uh, generally performs in the, the mid-range globally on most governance metrics, but in the upper end in the MENA region. Uh, so, so it's kind of there in the upper middle. Um, the enigma I find in Jordan is that there's plenty of talented and thoughtful leadership and a capable civil service. I mean, Dr. Ibrahim really hit this on the head when he talked about, uh, you, know, you know, senior Jordanian public sector managers. There are many very talented, very capable, very gifted folks. And yet, historically, a lot of Jordanian public sector reform efforts have underperformed. Uh, they haven't delivered to the extent that uh, one would have hoped. And I, I think there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, there are sort of hardware and software. On the, on the hardware side, Jordan's in a tough neighborhood. You have a lot of exogenous shocks. And, uh, and that's just, you know, by dint of where you are, where you live. And, and then secondly, you have the West Bank, East Bank design, uh, divide and the fact that the East Bank in particular is very uh, reliant on public employment and uh, um, is very influential within broader Jordanian politics. And so, so these are challenges that will have to be managed. But then there are also some administrative practices, the software where you well that Jordan uh, does. And these are things that could potentially change. Uh, one of the challenges is the frequent churning of ministries. Uh, for Marzuka to do his reforms, he had five years and then he had a hand-picked successor who had another five years. So it was a 10-year enterprise and uh, most successful public sector reforms uh, are not done in an afternoon. They take quite a while to set up and reinforce and maintain. And the problem in Jordan is when you're frequently churning your ministries, uh, bringing in new ministers at a, a frequent rate, you just don't have the long-term time that it takes for a lot of these uh, agendas to succeed. And then what happens is a new minister comes in <clears throat> and often tends to redefine the agenda, doesn't 
legal panel by what his predecessor does and it heads off in another direction. Um, anyhow, I, I see my, my time is coming to an end. Here are a couple of solutions I will offer up briefly and then I will give it over to Tarek. Um, point number one, uh, Jordan is going to have a tight fiscal environment for some time to come. Uh, the bad news is that, uh, you know, complicates the task of undertaking expensive reforms. The good news is that most successful public sector reforms happen in an environment of fiscal constraint. Uh, <clears throat> there's an old adage uh, you can attribute to Churchill or Machiavelli it's, or, or Ron Emanuel, it's been around forever, but just don't let a good crisis go, go to waste. Um, secondly, uh, I think the experience of Marzuka was very interesting. Salam Fayyad had a quite similar approach in nearby Palestine, and that is uh, strategic opportunism. Uh, instead of rolling out grand and grandiose plans for public sector reform, and I, you know, I've done a few of those in Jordan myself, uh, articulate the direction you want to go and then take advantage of the opportunities that, that present themselves. Give reformers time and space to work. Uh, we talked about that. That's going to be absolutely essential. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think Jordan lags a bit in IT, and and uh, we won't have time to have this conversation now. But it's worth thinking, given that the further trajectory, or the future trajectory, is e-governance in many countries. How can Jordan can position itself on that? Uh, use available tools strategically and cultivate managerial talent. Uh, so anyhow, uh, some advice, friend to friend, Tarek. Let me turn it over to you now. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and thank you, Ibrahim, for, uh, for giving us this opportunity to share uh, the results of and some of the tentative conclusions that we've put out in this publication. Uh, as uh, Bob mentioned, Jordan figures very prominently. And many of the lessons we draw from the book, from studying these cases, come from Jordan. Um, and Jordan will continue to be uh, an important uh, venue, uh, a place where public sector reforms will be uh, updated, relaunched, deepened. Uh, and so this conversation has to continue. I will be very brief in the interest of saving time and opening up the floor for a broader discussion, but perhaps my comments will focus on the on uh, a couple of observations uh, to provide the context today for this publication. Um, when this book was uh, going to the publisher um, in mid to late 2019, before COVID, uh, in fact, had become a global pandemic, uh, we were becoming increasingly uh, convinced after observing the protests that took place in 2018 and 2019 in many parts of the region, in many countries that had escaped the Arab Spring protests, whether it's Algeria, Iraq, Lebanon, Sudan, uh, and even uh, Jordan, 2018, had seen some social unrest. We were convinced that the case for public sector reform, the imperative of public sector reform, the need to improve services uh, was uh, urgent. And that in fact, uh, governments needed to uh, pay greater attention and invest more in an agenda that quite frankly, they had neglected for uh, over a decade. If you recall Dr. Ibrahim and many members of the audience, uh, we became too, too much, uh, uh, involved with the democratization project, with the political reform project, and rightly so, because it affects reforms, including public sector reforms. But we ignored, and because of the political instability that took place in many countries, we ignored the public sector, government, government capabilities, government uh, abilities to discharge responsibilities, basic responsibilities. And so we were convinced in early uh, 2019 that public sector reforms as an imperative as a need 
is back on the table. We were also quite satisfied with the observation that the region had enough experience within itself. It didn't always have to look outside. It didn't need to import solutions. There's a wealth of experience. We capture a very small part of it. Uh, and we thought uh, there are lessons within the region that can be adapted, that can be made country specific, that might provide the motivation and the example for countries to follow. Uh, we were, I would say, overall quite satisfied with that conclusion. But then came COVID-19. Uh, and as COVID-19, not just a public health pandemic, but also a major economic recession in the region began to take hold, uh, we saw uh, an opportunity and we became even more persuaded by the need for uh, public sectors, governments in our region to invest in themselves, to become more capable, more efficient, more responsive, more dynamic. After all, we saw in 2020 and we continue to observe today how how governments stepped in, were forced to respond to the pandemic with not only a host of public health measures, uh, the lockdowns, the, uh, the testing, the tracking, some other coordination, uh, but also the fiscal and monetary support that some governments uh, extended and others to the extent that they can, did provide. In our view, the case for public sector reform became even stronger partly because we believe in, a, in the midst of this pandemic, we discovered or rediscovered the importance of having a well-functioning, capable public sector. Many of the issues surrounding the pandemic are here to stay. Some of the economic damage that has been inflict inflicted on the region will be here for not just months, but years. The recovery will be a long recovery. And low and middle income countries uh, will suffer probably a lot of adjustment and dislocation as they try to recover. Um, life will not go back to how things were, if you can assume that things were good, for a long time to come. Uh, in our view, the need to focus, to relaunch, to revolutionize the public sectors, to make them more responsive, accountable, dynamic, efficient, is even stronger in light of all of this today that it was just a few years ago. It's going to be driven by the circumstances on the, the ground, the economic need, the immense damage that has been inflicted by the pandemic on sectors, on workers, on poverty, on vulnerability, and the length of time it will take for the recovery to take place. If this opportunity, Dr. Ibrahim, can be seized upon in countries where you can forge the kind of political consensus, the kind of political uh, understanding and agreement between states and society, uh, I think you can make a lot of progress. I say this in reference to your initial remark where you challenged some of the findings of the book. Maybe we didn't make them very clear. I'm happy to restate them very briefly uh, and make uh, the following uh, observation, which should be obvious to everyone. Public sector reforms, even small ones, take place in a political context. Political support is needed. Political stability is needed. It doesn't have to always be explicit. It doesn't have to always be overriding. But the successful cases in our book are cases where reformers and reforms were consistent with national objectives. They were consistent with whatever consensus is out there about how society wants to move how the state is responding. Jordan, I would argue today, uh, is in the middle of, uh, the big, or in, in the big, at the beginning of a conversation, a conversation about the future of the political system, about the future of the state, the division of labor and responsibilities. It is this context uh, that makes me, uh, to a large extent, hopeful about the possibility of giving the public sector and giving reforms as a project a new mandate, a mandate uh, that can help rebuild uh, and push the country towards having the sort of uh, government that is responsive, that is dynamic, 
that is able to cope with a set of very difficult circumstances that we have not seen in generations, not just in Jordan, but elsewhere uh, in the region and in many parts of the world. The recovery from where we are today is long. Uh, there are a lot of headwinds, but I think it's that political context that gives ministers stability, gives them a long tenure, allows them to experiment with the reforms. The reforms don't just drop on you from the sky. One of the big and most important lessons in, in, from our cases, in our view, is the emphasis on reforms being almost organic in nature. Uh, you don't start with a design for every single step of the way that you go out to execute. There are a lot of experimentation taking place. Adapt yourself, you solve one problem, you go on to the other problem. If ministers and government officials, reformers are given enough time and enough political support that is within national objectives, a lot of progress uh, can be made. I remain hopeful, we remain hopeful about this agenda, but we're also uh, mindful of the immense challenges we face the risks ahead and the need to take on uh, the tasks of rebuilding states, rebuilding societies and creating dynamic economies in a very forceful, credible and serious manner in the future. Let me stop here, Dr. Ibrahim, and perhaps we can uh, open the floor for, uh, for a many rounds of Q&A, uh, observations, remarks from the audience. It's been a pleasure being with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tariq. Thanks, uh, Rob, for uh, this overview of the findings of the book and also with the, the highlights that has uh, uh, been uh, put in Jordan and uh, its reform. Um, I have a number of questions that already have been uh, sent, and uh, this is my invitation for all. Uh, for all our participants, if they have questions, please uh, log in and uh, or uh, raise hand so we give you the opportunity to uh, drop or to uh, direct your questions. Um, but Tariq, just to kick off the, 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 the discussion and to push the discussion further, uh, of course, public sector reform needs, as you described, the right political context for this to happen and sometimes the question is is shall we wait for that political context to to be ready for us to start or as uh, i read even in your book is that sometimes the way your bureaucracy and your state is functioning is a reflection of your also political system in a way uh, I, I don't want to complicate things, but it's chicks and eggs where you start, where you break this cycle, because the most talked about maybe topic in at least Jordan and in the region is public sector reform. How big, how inefficient, and how dangerous it is. As you put it even in the summary of your book, this, the functioning and the efficiency of the public sector could be a source of stability or a source of upheavals in, 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 in these countries. Yet those within this bureaucracy, uh, the most secured, sometimes they have these safe jobs, jobs for life, etc., etc. What is the motivational sort of system that or punish or encourage for us to start moving? And I know that even Rob in the small model, he talked about this term that I like very much, the strategic uh, opportunity, opportunism, which is to me uh, that you have that entity that somehow managed uh, to, uh, uh, to make a success story in Jordan, which all, we all feel, feel and we are all proud of, of, of that entity and the way it's functioning. But that was not, uh, to tell you the truth, contagious somehow. That, that success was limited to that model. There, were, there was some progress elsewhere, but that was an outstanding uh, institution working. Where do you go? Do you want to go silos, starting to improve things here and there, and then hopefully they will get together? 
Do you want to have a comprehensive view? Do you wait for the political? I'll just kick off the discussion with this question, and uh, then I'll see if there are, and then I'll, 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 I'll direct the question, the rest of the questions to you if, you, if, if that's okay. Rob, I'll go with you first. Sorry, uh, I'm a mute. <laughs> Dr. Ibrahim, thanks. That is an essential question. You got uh, right to the core. Um, and it's a very complicated question. Uh, we noticed a couple of things. I mean, obviously, there were some cases like the e-governance case in Dubai that played out exactly as Tarek said. I mean, Sheikh Mohammed wanted it. It was essential to his vision of Dubai, Dubai's developmental future. He pushed for it tenaciously. Uh, but uh, in, in a number of the other cases, uh, it was more an example of, uh, there's a wonderful Russian phrase that basically means heaven is high and the czar is far away. Uh, reforms were being undertaken that were blessed by the political leadership, but the political leadership was often not intimately involved. They were consistent with the broader direction, they were where they wanted to go, so they were supportive. But uh, beyond this sort of general sense of support, uh, the reforms really resided with the uh, individual minister or head of the agency head. And the good news in MENA is uh, individual ministers often have a fair amount of latitude and scope to do what they want to do. Problems arise when the reforms cross ministerial boundaries because coordination mechanisms are weak and it's often difficult to get other people to play ball. But within various ministries, uh, you know, people do have discretion and, uh, and uh, Marzuka was able to take full advantage of that. Uh, and really exploit that tenaciously. Now, as I understand it, uh, uh, you or others may know better, he had the tacit support of the king. The king, uh, you know, wanted these reforms move forward. But, uh, uh, you know, Merzuka was able to take them, uh, take them. So, so, so the good news is, uh, you know, at the level of the individual agency, strategic opportunism, you can often get some things going. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's helpful. It may not be huge, but the goal is to take a few steps going, build some momentum, uh, and then use that as a springboard for, uh, for broader things. If I can build on that, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, very, very briefly. Um, please, go ahead, Tal, please. Yeah, I agree. I think you pose an important question. Uh, and uh, it's a question that can be misconceived, misunderstood, and provide reason for uh, complacency. Should we wait until the political system is ready, until it sees itself as stable before we do reforms? Uh, I think that would be very dangerous, and that would not be uh, consistent with how we have formulated the conclusions uh, in, our, uh, in, in our book, based on the experience we observed. I think what we were trying to say much more clearly is you have to pay attention to the political context and organize your reform projects uh, and reform steps and reform initiatives uh, so that you uh, are able to secure the political support that you need and more importantly avoid opening up the gates of political battles and obstacles that you may not necessarily want at a given point in time. It might be easier doing that, as Bob just mentioned, in the context of line ministries. So yes, you can work in silos at the level of ministries, agencies, and authorities and get a lot done because the agency or the authority is under your control. The minute you veer off into contexts or reform areas, that touch upon multiple ministries that require coordination, require political negotiation. Think of civil service reform, think of human resource development, think of the cabinet example from, uh, from Jordan. Uh, that is where the political support and the national political object objectives can become binding. If they're not there, they can slow you down, they can disrupt uh, your work. Uh, and so it is a call in many ways 
for reformers and for people at the very top to be cognizant of the political context in which the reforms take place. Uh, I think the strategic opportunism uh, approach uh, was captured in, in the book by Salam Fayyad, who coined the phrase that Bob likes to use a lot. Salam's response to questions about what he's trying to do and how he's sequencing his own reform plans was to, to say the following. I'm trying to do what you can, wherever you can, as soon, as soon as you can do it. At times, it does require of reformers uh, pragmatism, flexibility, and a sense of opportunism to see the opportunities to seize on them and to uh, uh, exploit them to push for with reforms. It's easier to do, obviously, within ministries, easier to do within sub-ministries than it is to perhaps pursue them at the great, greater national level, unless there is the political context, unless the country has committed itself to pursuing exactly that path. Last but not least, Dr. Brahim, and we devote a little bit of space in the book to this. This was a surprise for me as, a, as an analyst. Uh, for a very long time, we, we shunned the notion that leaders matter, that this is as much about the individuals as it is about the reforms. Well, one of the findings in, in the book, based on the case studies, is that in fact leadership qualities of reformers happen to make a big difference. They cannot carry reforms totally through, but to the extent that leaders lead by example, they set the tone, they establish rules, they surround themselves by teams, and they work within their respective agencies to ensure that people are focused while making the necessary compromises uh, in order to achieve the larger purpose, uh, they tend to, in general, be amongst the successful reformers. How do you create leaders? How do you incentivize leaders? How do you support the emergence of such leaders? Is something we have to kind of pursue uh, in another conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq and Rob. Let me just now go through, uh, I'll try to uh, summarize the question that I have. But I want to start with this notion, Rob, that what we need, and Tariq, and this is a conversation that I have with a, a very good friend of mine who has long experience from the private sector working with the government, is that what we should promote is a revolution within bureaucracy, not a revolution on bureaucracy. This notion, second notion or last notion, would create a huge resistance. If you are going to revolt against that, then they are very united and it will be difficult. So this is something that also we need to, to be able to manage. I have uh, some questions that I would like to, to uh, throw, and if I get more questions, I'll, I'll, I'll get it through. I have also one question on Jordan in particular that maybe because we talk about the cabinet, we talk about this committees or the quasi policy functions and the lack of, and this is the case of Jordan, which I really would like to hear you is that there's an absence of policy advisory support as well. It's sometimes not the lack of desire to take decisions. However, it's the lack of the support or the needed support, adequate support, timely support to enable you to take that decision. So you keep sometimes going around and around, but avoid taking the decisions. Maybe although you are convinced, but because you lack the the, the, the probably the institutional support, the information, or whatever you are missing, it's you're not empowered to take decision at the right moment. Now, I think most of Arab countries, and, and uh, I know that both of you are very aware of creating parallel structure to bureaucracy as well. Creating incentives within the bureaucracy as well. Is that a solution? to incentivize the public sector to move forward. This is something that I leave it to you. And also, um, 
what reforms that we've done? I'll, I'll, I'll throw this question and then you can uh, either divide or just gather them for the sake of time. Um, about the integrity or the good governance within the public sector and how much reform we've done in terms of improving that governance. I think the fifth slide, Rob, uh, you presented the status of governance structure, but what reform and what are the key issues that we need probably to visit? This is a, a question from Yasmin Abu Zahur, of Zahur. Uh, and also, given the economic slowdown in the region now, uh, how can we ensure that we can promote uh, a private-public partnership most effectively? And we have examples of, you know, examples on, on, on really in the post-COVID-19, and this is a case in Jordan that now we're managing COVID-19, probably we are managing COVID-19 fairly well, but the day after COVID-19, it's not clear where we're heading and what, what needs to be done uh, 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 to that uh, effect. Labi uh, Bahlal uh, is interested in learning more about the sustainability of public sector reform and how we can uh, sort of uh, do the monitoring uh, and I think it is about ensuring that this is not a one shot, it's a sustainable, dynamic, interactive process that makes sure that we overcome challenges and not sort of pushing challenges uh, ahead of us. And for, with that, there will be, uh, of course, uh, cost benefit analysis that will be associated uh, uh, with them. Uh, Mazen uh, Dole is asking if you, where is the most successful uh, sort of uh, reform that, that has been done in the region where Dubai is, 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 uh, uh, is, is, is ranking in that, uh, to that effect, is there is a, a classification for MENA. I'll stop here unless there are some, I see more questions coming, but I'll, I'll give you the chance to quickly respond. I know some of these questions are quite huge and need probably another, but this is good. This is good because maybe, uh, Tarek, this is one way of pushing this agenda further and talk about it more and more because it affects our daily life and every single interaction we have uh, uh, on a daily basis. I'll, I'll go back uh, to you, Rob. <clears throat> Dr. Ibrahim, thank you. Uh... I, I will take the easy questions and leave the hard ones for Tarek. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, these are excellent, excellent questions. Um, I, I think on the point of, uh, you mentioned uh, proper policy support, a uh, fundamental issue and one that you're absolutely right. There's a gap in many countries uh, in the region. Uh, you remember our Jordan case begins with a discussion of uh, chicken farms in Amman and cabinet meant to discuss this issue on three separate occasions. You know, are there too many? What are the public health issues? Should they be relocated? And there had, no preparatory work was done. Nobody knew how many chicken farms there were, how much it would cost to relocate them, what exactly the public health input was. So cabinet spun its wheels on three separate occasions. And so building this capacity is absolutely essential. It, it doesn't just materialize, it, it takes really a very conscious effort to, to go about and develop. And, and it's hard to do because uh, you need to have staff with uh, skills in cost benefit analysis or, or consulting and uh, managerial practices. You need to pull together a team uh, with a, a cross-cutting uh, skill profile to really adjust, um, you know, sectoral expertise and things like that to address these issues, but but it's fundamental, and, and a lot of countries to do this are shortcutting, and that was one of the other questions that were done. They're setting up some of these independent entities. Uh, that are outside of the broader civil service process, process that are being paid well above standard civil service rates. I mean, Saudi Arabia has done a lot of this uh, to try to jumpstart its uh, Vision 2030 reform program. And uh, <clears throat> my view, uh, you know, is this a good idea or a bad idea? Uh, in the near term, it's a good idea and that it can give you access to expertise you wouldn't otherwise have that can be vital to taking good decisions. 
over the long term, it's a bad idea because it can lead to fragmentation in the broader public sector and all sorts of uh, dysfunctional results. And, and so the question in essence is, how, can you design these entities in a way that you can benefit from the good that they bring and avoid the long-term costs? And I, I think you can, I, I think there are ways to do that, uh, but uh, I'm not sure a lot of thinking has been taking place in the region about how exactly uh, that can be stood up. Uh, I, on the question of most successful reforms, uh, you know, that's really a good question. I mean, I think Dubai has done some things well. Uh, if you look at the quality of service delivery, uh, Sheikh Mohammed has really instilled an ethos throughout the government uh, uh, that high quality service delivery is important. Uh, and I was privileged to serve as a judge for the smart government uh, contest in Dubai a few years ago. And it was interesting to see even in obscure corners of the, of the bureaucracy, this ethos had permeated and people were working very hard to uh, uh, deliver value added and uh, you know efficiency gains and service delivery gains and things like that. And so, so it was impressive to see the ethos he's been able to articulate. However, Dubai also illustrates one of the challenges, and it's a broader challenge uh, throughout the region, and that is the challenge of effective regulation. And, and where is the boundary between the most appropriate boundary between the public sector and the private sector? Uh, I, you know, Dubai's in the business of running boat tours uh, by the Burj Khalifa, this, you know, and, and in most countries, that's not a uh, service that the public sector would feel in any way compelled to provide. So, so I, I, I think this question is an important one and needs to be looked at carefully in terms of both uh, sectors. Uh, in the nature of the services uh, being provided. And, you know, there are some countries that do well on certain dimensions and less well on others. Briefly, Tariq, so I can come with a second round before we close. Let's go with the second round. I'm very satisfied with what uh, Bob has said. Come on, you must say something. Yalla, yalla. <laughs> okay, well, you know, some of the other lessons, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, that also come out of the, the case studies that are worth highlighting, and they apply both. To, to, they apply to Dubai, they apply to Jordan, they apply to Morocco, they apply to Egypt. Uh, the focus on communication. Um, 15 years ago, I, I would never have listed the, the importance of internal and external communication as one of the requirements for a successful reform effort. I think it's, a, it's very obvious to everyone today, not only because of social media, but because of the amount of information and misinformation that is circulating at any point in time. How reformers incorporate the need to communicate, to deliver messaging, and to make that messaging consistent with actually what they are working on, able to achieve and not achieve, is going to be increasingly one of the requirements of any successful reform effort. Uh, another perhaps uh, requirement for success that we've observed in a lot of cases, and it doesn't always apply across all reform initiatives, uh, the need to build credibility very early on. Now, it might be easier if you are delivering documents, printing passports, uh, improving uh, the queues at, uh, at the entrance of, a, of an agency. Uh, to show that you have, in fact, uh, some quick wins uh, that are visible to the public, that enhance your credibility, it will be very di difficult, much more demanding, if you're working on public financial management or transparency of, uh, of, uh, of uh, policy processes. Uh, there are ways around it, but one of the lessons we feel uh, matters for the future is the need to deliver concrete results early on uh, to build credibility with both bosses at the top, but also with the public, especially if reforms need time, they require the public to, to, uh, to remain confident, and it provides you also with a level uh, of support. So uh, these two, I think, should also be part of the mix in thinking about the design and formulation of 
of, of reforms as we get to, uh, to this agenda. But more to your point, Dr. Ibrahim, uh, and this is obviously goes beyond the public sector. Uh, I'm of the view that the nature, the mission, the role of the state in society, not just in our region, but around the world, period, uh, is being looked at differently as we emerge and recover from uh, the pandemic. Uh, you don't have to go very far. Look at the states. Look at what governments, uh, what the, the two governments have done in the last two years, and look at what they're planning in order to ensure a recovery, to promote a recovery, and to and to to enhance the role and credibility of regulation, oversight. I think the trend of strengthening the state, bringing back the state, uh, is going to be with us for a long time to come. It need not come at the expense of the private sector. But uh, we should not be surprised to see even international institutions, such as the IMF and the World Bank and others, emphasizing and, uh, and uh, highlighting the importance of having capable states, uh, efficient states moving forward, states that need to tackle, quite frankly, the damage that COVID-19 has done that is beyond our, uh, our reach right now, even our knowledge. So this conversation, I think, is going to stay with us and it's going to be part and parcel of how we look at the reform agenda for the public sector. Thank you, thank you. I'll have this final round of uh, questions, so bear with me. One of the questions that I uh, received from uh, His Excellency, Vice Minister Salim, is that is reform is an end by itself or is it a byproduct uh, of what I want to achieve? Uh, and what is meant is that I have huge economic challenges that I am encountering that I'm trying to overcome. So it's like he is suggesting that a kind of a reverse engineering uh, process whereby we introduce the kind of reform that we want. And, uh, uh, and he emphasizing this notion of product or byproduct because he said that I want a functioning uh, uh, public sector that would enable me to overcome the challenges that I'm and accordingly, maybe I can prioritize or, 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 or do that things. The second question, which is related somehow, uh, Tarek, to what you have ended with, is uh, in, in one of the questions, in, uh, in, there is this Chinese model, which is delivering, which is getting people out of poverty. And maybe it's providing us with a different perspective as to what kind of public sector that we want. And maybe, maybe as written in the question, uh, a linear public sector, as we're trying to identify, is not something that is required, while maybe a different formula uh, is, is, is needed uh, for that matter. Um, another question is about strategic opportunism. Uh, is it part of an agile strategy approach? And if so, how could supporting, uh, we could support a culture uh, to be created in the public sector uh, for that? Uh, matter. Uh, Pop, do you have a question that could you tell us more about cost cons containment versus expenditure efficiency, uh, which uh, apparently is being used in, in, uh, uh, in, in the book? And um, do you think that the success of e-governance e reform in some countries is also linked to security related issues both at home and, at, and outside? Here's the uh, question is getting uh, slightly complicated. Uh, but um, um, the rest of the question are quite uh, somehow being answered. I have this question in Lebanon, uh, maybe you can reform uh, uh, from Samar Haider, which is given the very complex political context uh, and the severe crisis in Lebanon. Uh, organic reform, as mentioned by Dr. Tariq, we can expect and what could be a private sector role in this, especially in a country where this sector is still uh, vibrant uh, and one that has had for decades took over a lot of tasks and services, which are the government's responsibility. So where to go from here, given the difficult uh, situation? Basma uh, Abdul Khaliq, how did you analyze and tackle the role of donors in supporting successful reform 
in developing MENA countries. I'll stop here. It's a lot of questions, but I'll give you this final round, Bob and Tariq. Uh, shall we go with you, Tariq, and then give the final word for uh, Bob? I'll start with Bob. He knows the, the answers. I just follow up on what he says. <laughs> okay, Bob. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Tariq's the sweeper. So uh, as a midfielder, when I make the mistake and they get past me, he takes care of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, Again, a, a rich set of questions. Um, the motivations are always fascinating to see. And over my years uh, in the World Bank, if somebody would come to me, a uh, minister or uh, senior civil servant, and say, I just want to do this because it's the right thing, my eyes would glaze over because public sector reform is difficult, complicated, painful, and, and if you just want to do it because golly, it, it makes sense. Or sometimes people say, you know, I heard about performance budgeting uh, uh, in Australia and we want to do that, uh, you know, and we want to do that here. Those sets of reforms uh, typically don't last. I mean, uh, for reforms to really endure and be embedded, uh, they very much need to be in the, I'm trying to achieve this. This is what I'm trying to achieve. In order to get there, I need to make these changes. And, I, and, and that's the sort of the set of motivations that tend to ensure uh, both that they get done in the beginning and that they're sustainable over the long term. So, so I, I think that was a very good question. And uh, yeah, reforms that sound good typically don't have the strength to go the distance. It's the, it's the ones that solve real problems that really, uh, that, that really endure. Uh, cost containment versus expenditure uh, efficiency. That's an excellent question. Uh, most of the challenges we have is that budget conversations in many, many countries go something like, I'd like 20, no, you get 15. Well, how about 17? Uh, no, we'll give you 16. Uh, and so they tend to be that sort of, you know, abstract debates, just haggling as you would in a souk. Uh, but not necessarily focused on how much do you really need to uh, to do your job effectively, and and here um, I think what the the Saudis have really done something very interesting. They set up a center for spending efficiency, uh, which does a lot of very good systematic research. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, this was one of those entities that was set up outside of government. It reports to CEDA, it reports directly to the Ministry of Finance. They pay salaries that are way above the broader uh, public sector in Saudi Arabia. So, so, you know, they do certain things that have allowed them to assemble really a top-notch team. But then having done that, uh, they, they think about problems very comprehensively uh, with the end goal being effective service delivery. So they will say, we want to have high quality services delivered. That's the goal. We're not going to compromise that. But are there ways we can structure costs more efficiently? You know, can we co-use facilities? I mean, a lot of times individual agencies show up and each one wants their own training center. And so they'll say, no, I mean, these centers are used uh, you know, three or four hours a day, you two share it. And, and, or they look at business process reengineering. Uh, how can we streamline these things? Sometimes they'll look at IT investments. So they'll say, we're willing to spend more in the near term, but we expect sustained savings downstream. And so, so it's having that sort of a sophisticated approach that looks at long-term issues of efficiency, effectiveness, and not just, uh, you know, can we save a few dinners by reducing their budget by 10%. Uh, uh, and and uh, so that's that's something I think is interesting. The role of um, donors, I, I, I obviously have some bias here. I spent a lot of time at the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. I, I think donors can be useful uh, in a number of dimensions. Uh, I mean, obviously, if it's a matter of big ticket financing for IT systems or retrenchment packages or things like that. Donors can often be helpful with that sort of financing. I, I, I think donors can be useful uh, in uh, providing access to uh, international experience and global best practice. They can help uh, understand what's going on elsewhere and then in the other region. 
But the interesting thing for me was most of the time when I was in the bank, I, I think our broader or our, the best service that we provided, and we did this knowingly, was serving as a foil for internal reformers to sort of point at us. And so we would sit down with people uh, and say, what's the fundamental issue that needs to change? And they say, if you really want to be effective, we need to do A, B, and C. And so then we would have conversations with uh, people in government and we say it's our understanding that A, B, and C are major issues. And then these people would take that and say, oh man, those bastards in the bank, you won't believe it. They're having us do A, B, and C, so we need to get out there and do it because they're breathing down our neck. And so we would be used strategically as a pawn by well-intentioned reformers in their institutions to, to try to take forward a reform agenda that they themselves were really trying to push. Thanks, Paul. Got it. Very, very briefly, Dr. Ibrahim, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. Uh, I'm glad Bob mentioned the business process reengineering that uh, Dr. Benson had, had brought up. Um, I wish we had devoted more time and space for it in the book. We highlight it in the context of, uh, uh, of a number of the chapters. And uh, clearly, in many of the interviews with the reformers over time, uh, the sense of reforms being both uh, a means to an end, but also an end in, in of themselves, uh, which is captured most clearly with the business process reengineering, comes out uh, strongly. And you know, uh, these are the type of reforms that uh, most people would describe as being very difficult, uh, very demanding. Uh, I think it was it is, was Yed Bahadim who compared uh, these processes of reforms as uh, plumbing work. You're getting your hands really down and dirty and, and, and trying to sort of uh, uh, ease up blockages or reroute uh, uh, processes so as to create the necessary dynamism or efficiency within the system. More on this, hopefully, in the future. I was intrigued by the question about China. I think we can devote another session to this. Dr. Ibrahim is in a good position to, to speak about this. Uh, me and him have traveled to China together. We've met with our Chinese colleagues uh, with the goal of trying to understand how they organize themselves, what they do, and how uh, they do it. Uh, I've got good news and bad news, uh, very briefly. The good news is there's a lot uh, in the way that China manages its affairs that we can learn from. Uh, targets, benchmarks, decentralization, emphasis on efficiency, uh, uh, rules, processes, and, uh, and that's good news. Uh, the bad news is you can't just import that into our region so easily so so readily because it's context specific unfortunately the people who speak about the china model in our region don't usually speak about the efficiency and the effectiveness and the accountability dimensions of their bureaucratic approach they speak about it in terms of the top-down management controls the authoritarian side of china and so we we, we need to be very careful here when we uh, when we seek out experience or inspiration from as complex and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and a very challenging system to understand and, and one that is difficult to, to, to always appreciate from the outside as, uh, as that of China. Perhaps the last word and uh, the question that came uh, from Lebanon. Um, I'm spending a lot of time these days thinking about uh, Lebanon and Iraq. Uh, uh, because I'm trying to understand Libya. Um, and so uh, I think the nature of, of many of the problems in, in Lebanon today and, uh, and even in, in Iraq, uh, we're seeing them also extend to Libya. We might also see them uh, extend to post-conflict countries such as Syria and Yemen in the future. I worry about the power sharing approach to managing our societies. Uh, I think power sharing uh, formula work well to achieve peace, to stabilize uh, uh, countries, 
in the short term and to, to achieve ceasefires, but they have proven to be incredibly uh, dysfunctional at allowing societies to, uh, to take on the big important agendas of restructuring, putting visions, arriving at national consensus, undertaking reforms. And so I worry right now that as more and more countries emerging from conflict in our region begin to adopt what seemed very logical initially as power sharing um, uh, formula to buy peace, they might lock themselves into dysfunctionality over an extended period of time. This is not to say that Lebanon has to, has, has to wait uh, or uh, go through a revolution in order to, to address the long-standing and challenging uh, developmental, economic, and political issues it faces. Uh, it is only to highlight the dangers in ignoring the underlying political fabric and structure and uh, agreements that might in fact have uh, pushed countries in the trajectory that they may not necessarily want to be on over time. Uh, I, I'm speaking selfishly about this obviously because I'm, I'm, I'm from Libya and I worry that uh, what initially has been billed as power short-term power sharing uh, might become a decades-long um, um, framework for not resolving problems, postponing them into the future. We can have a broader discussion about this, hopefully, sure. another time. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Well, uh, Bob Antarik and Brooking Institute in Doha, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. And I'm sure uh, the still remaining unanswered questions uh, uh, maybe require another session to extend our discussion and uh, maybe focus on a certain uh, certain issue uh, that are of very relevant of relevance to the policy making uh, we are engaged at the gsf in public sector reform as an exercise and pop you should expect an invitation from us of course and uh, dr Tarek, our good friend that really want to dwell on this more and more and we want to seek also for you know the opportunities uh, that such uh, uh, institutions can uh, think about in order to further and enhance this relation without any further ado i thanks all the participants all those who directed questions all those who remained with us until now and i'm sure that is ushering uh, uh, a new sort of wave of activities that we hope to have with uh, Brookings Doha. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarek. Thank you, Dr. Bob. And thank for Sumaya, Amani, and all the teams that work together, the translator that being with us for making this a successful event. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.